Hey folks, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. It has been more than a minute since my last video, and I am so happy to be back in the observatory, in the workshop, working with my, my gear, doing astrophotography, enjoying astronomy. And um, I have a funny story to share with you all. Those who follow the channel know that I've been working on a 12-inch Newtonian restoration project. And I'll leave links to the first three videos in that series in the description below. But where I left off was a deployment of the instrument to the observatory. And I was feeling so good about this project, and I still do. But I re everything went sideways with that deployment. So this video, I'm going to cover what happened. My dome got knocked off its track. I broke my shutter system. And I even damaged my CEM120 mount. I'm going to cover all those topics. But I'm also going to share with you the first light that I gathered that evening. And, uh, and I will talk a little bit about what I've done to correct the issues that I ran into. So I think this is going to be a great video. It's a great return to the channel. And I hope you all enjoy it. So as a recap, I decided to rebuild a 12-inch Newtonian sometime in the end of 2024. And that included a total teardown of the telescope, a restoration of all its parts, the OTA, its mirrors, the focuser, etc. And then I rebuilt it um, with some enhancements. And I attached to it an image train uh, with an autofocuser, a filter system, and my trusty ASI 1600mm Pro. And it was a great uh, process, a great experience. I really enjoyed it. All was going well, and then it was time to deploy it. Uh, needless to say, I was super excited and uh, all was looking good. My dad and I walked the scope out to the observatory, and I have to give a shout out to my dad. He's 82 years old and he's in better shape than I am and absolutely couldn't do half the things I do with my observatory without him. So uh, I got this thing balanced on my CEM120 and this is where things got a little bit tricky. Um, this is a very large telescope and they all it's a Newtonian which means that they're back heavy. The vast majority of the weight is in the primary mirror and um, these older Newtonians, cheaper models, uh, have really, really thick um, uh, glass uh, that you, serves as the base of the mirror, and it is heavy. So to balance this telescope, you really, you really, you got to push the telescope pretty far up in the saddle so that... Uh, you know, your teeter point is, is, is closer to the back. But I thought I was really lucky. I was able to balance the scope, you know, in the declination and in the RA with just enough uh, clearance from the dome ceiling. At least I thought that was the case, but I would soon learn otherwise. So allow me to illustrate the issue. This is obviously the dome building. There's a pier, a mount, and the telescope which is slid forward to deal with the uh, weight imbalance uh, caused by the primary mirror and you'll notice that the dome has a radius of approximately four foot and there is a little motor mount up here that protrudes from the ceiling of the dome now when i exercised the mount i rotated it um, and noticed that at all points I seemed to be clear of the motor mount and I felt that this was, uh, well, I guess I thought that uh, I would not have any conflict here. But unfortunately, uh, my excitement to get this mount deployed, that emotion overrode my intellect because simple math would tell us that um, there's an issue here because all of these bodies are in motion. Note that I've indicated with a red line the lower, I guess the limit that the telescope's height uh, could possibly reach without making contact with the motor. I thought we were okay because again when we look we see that in only certain sections do the edges of the telescope uh, clear that that boundary. Unfortunately, 
if the dome is rotated and we now see that the motor, we're looking at the motor face on because the dome has rotated a certain amount, call it 90 degrees or so. Now we're face on with the motor, which has a length to it. And it now that protrusion spans a greater distance. And if we were to then rotate when this is slewing, when they're both slewing, you see that the corner protrudes and does make contact with the base of the motor. And this is exactly what happened. My telescope caught the motor and the with both the, both the dome in motion and the telescope, telescope slewing, this created an upward force and the rotational force of the dome caused it to leave its tracks. Terrible miscalculation uh, and I paid for it dearly. The good news is that this all happened after I got first light and uh, I do want to share that success with you first. So let's take a look at uh, the first light with this telescope and you know I happen to be a big fan of the moon as first light. It's hard to miss and it never fails to amaze me. So the moon was in a, uh, a waxing gibbous phase. It was about 75% illuminated and it was just a, 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 actually just a few days before what we call the worm moon, which is the uh, full moon of March. And it represents spring and, uh, you know, earthworms start to come out of the soil. So there's a lot of really interesting cultural history around the various full moons. At any rate, you know, I did check the collimation by eye and I deemed it to be more than acceptable. Uh, you will recall in prior videos, I, you know, I did some um, rough collimation using a laser and um, I also tested the autofocuser, which happened to have performed really well. I know a lot of us were concerned about whether or not these inexpensive focusers are, are capable of handling the weight of an image train and you know, performing properly. This actually performed really, really well. So I went ahead and I grabbed some frames using Nina. Um, and of course, you know, when you start to see images coming through, you get really excited. And then I used Sharp Cap. And, you know, overall, I have to say I'm very impressed with this result. This is a single frame grab uh, using Sharp Cap. And I, I just love the moon. It's such an impressive target. In fact, let's, let's, let's take a tour of some of its features. So here's the waxing gibbous moon as it appeared in March when I uh, did this capture. And this was just a few days before the full worm moon. And this phase is absolutely perfect for lunar observing because the sunlight strikes the surface at an angle and it casts these shadows that reveal details that you really can't get during full moon. Um, the best place to look is along what we call the terminator and that's the boundary between the night and the day on the moon and you can see the shadows that stretch across craters and mountain peaks and this contrast brings out much finer detail that you can that you can see uh, than you would see with a fully illuminated disc you know for example if we take a look in the southern hemisphere we can uh, better appreciate the dense cratered highlands and many of these craters are billions of years old. In fact, the smoother ones are older and some are much younger like Tycho. Uh, this guy is only 108 million years young. And during the full moon, you'll actually see really bright rays streaking radially away from its center. And that's all the ejected mass. But, but here, when it's along the Terminator, the central peak steals the show. And, and this peak was formed when the lunar crust kind of rebounded violently against the impact. So it was very early in the crater's life. When we traverse north, there's another famous crater that's present along this terminator, and it's called Copernicus, probably the most famous uh, crater on the moon. And it's about 800 million years old, and it sits just south of Mar Imbrium, which is Sea of Rains. And you can identify this sea by the rim, which is defined by the Apennine Mountains. Heading east, we're going to notice a cluster of these dark areas or these dark 
plains and and I like to point out uh, there's a trio of seas here serenity tranquility and crises and metaphorically these represent the progression of the human condition I for one have experienced the reverse crises and now I am tranquil that I've solved all my problems in the dome but at any rate um, for those who are curious, they're called seas not because they have water, they don't. They're called seas because they are cooled lava. And this is remnants of a very violent volcanic past that the moon does have. At any rate, this is a wonderful image and it was made possible because of the three-quarter phase that the moon is in at the time that I shot this. And it just goes to show you that every glance at the moon is revealing, it's exciting. And I have to tell you, I think this telescope did a wonderful job. Okay, so now let's get back to the observatory damage. Um, you know, getting the dome back on track was relatively easy. I, I actually just had to use a little bit of muscle to uh, push the dome uh, into place. Of course, I had already uh, freed the uh, telescope uh, from contact. Uh, so the dome was able to get back in, onto track relatively easily. I made some adjustments to the rollers that the dome um, rotates uh, over. And as for the shutter control system, I wasn't so lucky. The limit switches uh, were dislocated completely. Um, and you know what? That gave me reason to do something about that on the Divert, um, a, a solution to what I consider to be a very finicky dome control system. Let's take a look at that. So I mentioned that the shutter system had a catastrophic failure and I wanted just to, for those who are not familiar with shutters on domes or the Explorer dome, the shutter is a two-part mechanism. There's a, there's a lower shutter and an upper shutter um, the upper shutter being controlled by a DC motor and a cabling system. Um, and then the lower shutter is controlled by two actuators uh, that push the lower shutter out. At any rate, there's a sequence of operation that the shutters have to follow, uh, which, which, which are, um, I guess, gated by limit switches. And this is an electromechanical system that can be very, very finicky. And what I experienced was a breakdown in the limit switches themselves and was unable to control the shutter any longer. And what I've decided to do is replace this with a much simpler system. I'm first going to just point your attention to the upper shutter and that motor I was talking about, with the, which is really pulling a cable system. And there's also a limit switch. You can see a bracket and some loose wiring where the limit switches exist. There's one in the back and there's one in the front of the lip of the opening, of the, what we call the aperture of the dome. The, uh, those things are completely failing and, um, and they're very difficult to calibrate and position and quite frankly, I, 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 over the use of the dome for the last several years, I find them to be more of a nuisance than they are a benefit for me. In fact, most nights I come up, I m open up the shutters through manual controls and I image all night long and then in the morning I come and I shut the shutters. So I really don't need the need for the control. Um, on the lower end, I mentioned the two act, there are two actuators. These are what these are. These are um, um, used to push or pull uh, a rod, and uh, and that will cause uh, a rotation about this axis and an opening and a uh, opening and a closing of the of the of the lower lower shutter. Again, there are limit switches that are used to determine whether or not you've reached full extension. So what I've done is to simplify the entire thing yet retain the benefit of the electro electromechanical operation is I've, I've created a, my own box here where you'll see there are two switches on it. Uh, these are relays that reverse polarity. One says up, one says down. One controls the upper shutter motion and the other controls the lower shutter motion. So I'm able to, um, for example, if I would like to raise the lower shutter, I can just click on the up button and that will raise it. If I want to lower it, I can lower it. Now, I've opted not to leverage limit switches to control the motion, you know, to stop current from flowing, quite simply because I'm always here and I can use my own judgment as to when I should stop, you know, <laughs> opening or closing the shutter. At any rate, this system is a great relief to me and uh, it's, it's going to make, you know, makes uh, sessions in the observ observatory a lot more fun. So now the mount, on the other hand, um, 
required some assistance from the ioptron team and I, I you know roger kevin and john these are these are great folks over at ioptron i've always enjoyed my relationship with them um and uh, i encourage people whether it's your vendor uh your manufacturer get to know the people there because you're always going to run into problems with your equipment and it's nice to be on a first name basis with folks so they agreed to meet me at neef um and you can see here i'm with my dad at one of the talks and they did take the mount back to um Woolborn, massachusetts for repair and within a week i had a whole new worm drive, uh, drive assembly installed and a bunch of other things that were done to bring the, back, uh, the mount back into spec. And um, many of the things were covered under warranty, but of course this was my issue and uh, I paid for uh, the replacement worm. And so my friend and Steph and I, we went ahead and redeployed it to uh, to the observatory. And stepping up with you, you're stepping up and uh, you're going to step up. Uh, we'll just You're going to step up and I'm going to transition like this, you see? Okay, let's do it. Ready? On, on three. One, two, three. Now this next one. Yep. Oh, it's heavy. Well done. This time we properly balanced it and that required a little bit more MacGyvering. I had to have the OTA sit back in the saddle. That way we can avoid collision with the ceiling of the dome. And that meant that I needed some kind of counterweight mechanism. And what I decided to do was to go with some magnets uh, and some steel plate, which I picked up at Lowe's and cut down to size into strips. And I was able to use these, uh, these this counterweight system to basically get the OTA to balance in the deck in the deck axes and um, and the result uh, was was awesome all right I just wanted to share one last do-it-yourself trick when you're working with these large Newtonians um, often when our telescopes the rigs and the power requirements are sitting back uh, back relative to the mount and have easy access to USB and power ports that's not the case with this Newtonian it's a large tube the equipment is in the front, right, because our secondary is here, it comes up for our, our image train for the focuser. So I've just taken some very, very simple wire molding, and which has an adhesive back, and cut it to a few strips um, and uh, ad adhere to the tube, and I run my cables back, including an extension cable for my power, so they come out in the rear and, and can catch up with the... Uh, with the saddle that I have on the CEM120. This is really nice and uh, I've left a little bit of gap here so my clamps can go over and it just makes wire management a little bit easier. Okay folks, let's call that a wrap on this video. I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel and for your patience over the last couple of months as I've gotten through life and some of the obstacles that it's thrown my way. Uh, I'm really looking forward to using this telescope to capture some DSOs, so stay tuned. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. You're going to love this channel. If you're into astronomy and all things astrophotography, you can't go wrong. And with that, I will see everybody on the next video.